Okay. All right, here we go. Let's do this. All right, so let me, I'm also recording. So we're getting, is everybody recording on Audacity? Yep. Okay, so I'm going to sync us up. So uh, three, two, one, clap is how we're going to sync up the audio. So three, two, one. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to do the introduction. I have your bio here. It's great for the MSA because we have all the bios. Okay. Our first person that we will be interviewing, who knows which episode will come out first, but this is the first interview we've done. It is the Municipal Socialist Alliance candidate for University of Rosedale in Toronto, Ward 11, Adam Golding. Adam Golding was born in Toronto, raised in Barrie, Ontario, and has lived in University of Rosedale for 20 years, where he is currently the Municipal Socialist Alliance candidate for city councilor. Adam teaches piano from his home in Kensington Market. You may have seen the posters for anarchist piano lessons around uh, the city of Toronto. At the University of Toronto, Adam studied philosophy, mathematics, cognitive science, artificial intelligence, linguistics, psychology, and computer science, and got heavily involved with student politics. Adam focused on municipal politics when Mayor John Tory sued Khalil Sievright for erecting tiny shelters to save lives amid a state of emergency that Tory himself declared. He witnessed mass evictions and police violence at encampments last summer where he was physically harmed and arrested with dozens of others. That's when Torch, the Toronto Coalition for Housing, was formed. Following these events, Adam Golding worked on voter ID and fundraising for NDP campaigns and joined the Socialist Alliance, launched by leftists who are fed up with the status quo and fed up with the status quo opposition to the status quo. I always like that turn of phrase. I think that's quite good. Welcome, Adam. By the way, thanks for having me, everyone. Um, there's one thing that was cut from that bio that's very relevant because yesterday I was just screening films about Rochdale College at Film Cafe in Kensington Market. Uh, it's Socialist Tuesdays, three to six every Tuesday. I'm going to do more Rochdale films next week. The reason that's part of my bio is my mother lived in Rochdale, which is mm. part of how I got my radical politics. I lived, I grew up raised by a former Rochdalian in Barrie, and I've you know, lived here for 20 years, born here in Toronto. In, in for those, for and, yeah, those go who ahead. No, do you want to do you want to share a little bit about what is Rochdale? Well, yeah, I was just about to say um, it was you could call it a hippie flop house. The entire building was raided in 1975 at Bloor and Huron, and it lasted from 67 or 68 until then. And it was sort of a campus co-op experiment. There was the bookkeeping was very creative. They didn't actually pay their bills until about 10 years ago. Uh, campus co-op, yeah. and uh, yeah, I mean it's not often that the police raid an entire building. Um, uh, of students, well, and other people. <laughs> um, of course, they were all learning something. Um, they had alternative, very, very, very alternative education there. And it happened after Yorkville was gentrified by force. The cops uh, hit, kicked all the hippies out of Yorkville physically, and they all went into Rochdale, which had recently taken the locks off of its doors in some kind of like radical open policy. So they basically had squatters for almost a decade uh, <laughs> in this building. And my mother lived there, and they were all very, very radical people of the counterculture. And um, you can come see movies about it tomorrow, Tuesday afternoon, about the crazy place my mom used to live and part of why I got so radical. Uh, three oh, to yeah, six, that's really awesome. Tuesdays at Film Cafe, Socialist Tuesdays, we're showing movies and I'll do a little bit of music at some point. Emily, do you want to start off with some questions or can I? For sure. Um, so as it says in your bio, you got into municipal level politics in the aftermath of last year's encampment evictions, which I believe we talked about on the podcast um and we'll put a link into some information about that for anyone who's hasn't heard about that before mm. um so what what inspired you to kind of run for for this role out of that and what are you hoping for to to get out of this opportunity right. to run right well the, the inspiration did actually come a little bit before the evictions um i mean the mass evictions there were evictions happening i already knew tory had lifted an eviction ban uh, i think there were two of those uh lifted um I certainly remember being pissed off about them. And then I started paying much more close attention. And with the Khalil thing, that happened before the evictions, that um, he basically banned Khalil from saving anyone's life, um, which is what he was doing. And that was really soul destroying for the city. And I immediately picked up on that as a logician and a teacher. And I thought like, what are you teaching children? For instance, when, when, you, when you do this, you're telling them that you will be punished for saving a life. That is incredibly toxic and corrosive to our community. And um, not only that, but he was speaking gobbledygook about it. He was speaking logical nonsense, let's say, uh, when he was saying that, oh, those shelters are not safe. Well, not safe compared to what? 
compared to his yeah. condo or compared to dying. What they're not safe for is the city's insurance premiums. That's what they're actually talking about. If there's a tiny shelter fire, those insurance premiums go up. They don't pay anything if you die from exposure. They might not even know that you died from exposure. There's a lot of homeless people that went missing, quote unquote, this year. Like the deaths have doubled. Well, there's also people going missing, you know? Yeah. Um, Gru was just tweeting about that. Um, and anyway, the, the, the deaths doubled in the aftermath of him uh, banning Khalil from saving lives. And after that, so I, that's when I started paying attention, very close attention. Municip- like I was paying attention to politics. I paid attention to politics more after Trump won, but then specifically Toronto, I'm like, okay, I've learned my general stuff. So I was trying to learn everything in like a different context and then see if I can apply it locally. Um, like sort of abstract away from the particulars where I personally live to study general political theory, philosophy, math, yada, 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 history. And then I was like, okay, now I got to like, like, you know, bring it home, <laughs> so to speak. And, you know, I, I haven't, I haven't stopped studying, but it's all that's happening locally. And it, the actual evictions were really reprehensible. Um, some people, uh, we should mention that the Socialist Alliance has three candidates who were arrested on the same day. I'm so sorry. My Recording problem? You there, Emily? Yeah, sorry, my internet connection just got a bit fritzy. I think it should be good now. Okay, good yeah. to have extra recordings. So three of our candidates in the Socialist Alliance were all arrested on the same day, which is pretty unusual. Um, mm-hmm. It takes a lot to explain how strange things have gotten in our city that we're in that situation. That, like, it'd be strange enough if a political group had three candidates who were arrested at all, let alone on the same day. Um, so that, that's the kind of city we live in right now. I created a playlist called hashtag evict John Tory on YouTube, which includes every video I can find on YouTube of these encampment evictions, including some I recorded myself, including my quote unquote interview with John Burnside, who was running for office and needs to be voted out. He was, you know, on the ground managing all this crap. Um, you know, he reported to Tracy Cook, who reported to Chris Murray, who reported to John Tory. That is the chain of command. They all need to go. There are also counselors who um, all, almost all of the incumbents didn't vote for a judge to look into this afterwards. Only Perks and Matlow did the people. Yeah. Right. And, you know, that day there were a lot of uh, injuries. Over 30 people were arrested just at Lamport too. At uh, Trinity Bellwoods, there were uh, a few arrests and many injuries. I met a professor that day two minutes after the police had given her a concussion. Um, that yeah. is not how I normally meet professors. They broke a girl's arm at the following clearing. You know, there is someone who OD immediately afterwards uh, after the eviction at Lampart too, because, you know, they just lost all of their possessions and and had this hugely traumatic experience. And of course, people OD when they're not in their usual setting due to, you know, like habituation. Study that in your Psych 100 next book, folks. Um, and anyway, I, I could go on for hours and hours of all the horrific things that the police did and Star Security did. I was uh, also assaulted by Star Security at the Trinity Bellows clearing. And that's just my personal experience, you know. Um, I, I was one of the very fortunate people in that um, my charges were ultimately dropped. Some people are still facing charges. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tina Attree and the lawyers at M- MDC and at CJC are really great. They swooped in. I didn't even know they existed. I just showed up because I knew something was wrong. And I didn't know that anybody would have my back. And uh, mm-hmm. we still have to have the backs of people who are still facing charges. Um, uh, you know, running for office is one way we can increase the media pressure on the crowd to drop those charges, actually. Mm-hmm. So as we're continuing to build up here, so that's a, a lot of the context for what brought you to the Municipal Socialist Alliance. And so let's talk a little bit more about the Toronto Housing Coalition, which yeah. was formed in the aftermath of all these encampment evictions. It uh, had a slogan, if I recall correctly, stop, drop and roll, stop the evictions. Uh, no, uh, stop, drop, and roll. Stop the evictions, drop the charges, roll out the housing. Is yes. that correct? So talk about how that came together and what pressure you were immediately able to place on the city and then also where the organizing and the energy needs to go going forward because obviously we haven't won yet. People are still being evicted from the parks in Toronto and people still don't have access to reliable, affordable shelter. Yeah, well, the rolling out the housing is the hardest part, right? Um, that comes partly from policy change, which is why it's not just a uh, media pressure for even just the purposes of that campaign to get people running, is that you need actually different policies. And uh, one of those policies is um, uh, not a specific policy, like the general policy of uh, not having the police brutalize homeless people. That would be a great just general personal policy that you know the mayor could have, our councillors could have, um, and even more generally, just just not spending money on authoritarianism and being a control freak. Um, we have yeah. control freaks <laughs> in power. When, when I was a kid, my my mom from Rochdale didn't let me watch City Hall. She was afraid that I would become a politician. <laughs> what? And, and she was afraid that I would become a liar from watching mm. politicians. Mm. Um, 
well, that won't happen to me here. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we've got this whole framework. They're, they're not just liars. One thing she also said about politicians when I was uh, being raised by this woman is that they're all control freaks. And I see it every day. Um, you know, I, 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 I maybe would have figured it out myself, but I wouldn't have known exactly how to put it. They are control freaks everywhere. Um, and th those jobs attract control freaks. You have to elect people who aren't control freaks. Unfortunately, most of them don't run. Um, and there is that. You actually, if anything, you need people who who have maybe sort of traversed the spectrum and like been more or less of control freak at different times in their life or something like that. But we have a very um, just like you can be cramped in your in your muscular position. I think that well, I mean, I think does Tori sit like this? I don't know. I like, <laughs> Hello, I want to control you all, but I'll be nice about it. Um, that, that that's that's the vibe I get from these folks. Um, and you know, we have former cops managing the city. I mentioned the other day, if former cops manage cops, no one manages the cops. We shouldn't have former police in the city manager's office overseeing what the police are doing uh, in something like like the parks. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, I've forgotten what the question is. <laughs> so, so the stop, drop, and roll oh, yes. out the housing campaign. So the campaign. rolling, yes, thank you. And then now the dropping the charges has actually been going okay. Not everyone has had their charges dropped. So even the drop step is not um, uh, is not completed. Uh, now the stop, um, the mass evictions have stopped um, so far. Um, the moment we look away, they would probably just do it again. They they did get a lot of bad press. Tracy Cook probably is worried about her job at this point. You know, there's a petition to fire Tracy Cook um, on, at the in the mayoral debate uh, that. This time, oh yeah, we'll put we'll put it there. Yeah, in the in the evict John Tory playlist, um, in the mayoral debate that this time in history held, which is very good by the way. Everyone, three and a half hours of real really talking. The candidate is really talking. Um, they were not too. They were not too kind to Tracy Cook because that question came up for the whole panel of like, what are we going to do about her? Um, and um, the the mass evictions did not continue um, at Allen Gardens. Um, various uh, forces uh, prevented that um, for now. And that's one of the parks that we should experiment handing over actually to Indigenous governance. You know, there's. Um, I went to an event there where some speakers mentioned that they were long lost relatives. They were Indigenous people who met again in that park because they both became homeless and ended up there. And one thing Skylar Williams pointed out in the uh, conference we did outside of Tory's condo, which you can see at torch.help, uh, he said this right before he was arrested, actually, for giving this speech. And an hour later, Richard Kitching was arrested as he talked to me. We walked down the street, arrested by undercovers. They were trying to get more charges just to legitimize themselves. He was saying the encampments are, uh, you know, almost 30% Indigenous. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is in the year of truth and reconciliation. So there's echoes of all of that. And there's even echoes of Rochdale because these mass raids are a, a, they're a tactic that they think is, is a, a normal thing to do, to do a mass raid of a bunch of radicals. And yeah. by the way, you know what I couldn't believe that I learned the other day? Um, th that era when all, you know, there was sort of anti-hippie forces with the cops and so on. What, and, you know, there were like hippies are overrunning Yorkdale. One of those people was the former mayor Lamport, known as Lampy, who Lamport Stadium was named after. And oh. so they weren't just, you know, arresting 30 people anywhere. They're arresting 30 people at a place named after a former mayor who was anti-hippie. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Wow. No, wild. so that, yeah. And so we we do, yeah, we see it today as well. And then continuing, yeah, there are still evictions at Allen Gardens. We don't have the mass evictions. You mentioned policy. So not only do we need a mass resistance to encampment evictions, not only do we need to stand up for our neighbors and tents, not only do we need to oppose police brutality, but that's a stopgap measure, obviously. That's what we do right now to save as many people as we can, to, to build up our communities as much as possible. What do you envision then, and what has the Municipal Socialist Alliance collectively been advancing as a policy solution or as a programmatic solution to the problem of of houselessness, of lack of affordable shelter, and the other issues that abut up against the entire phenomenon of encampments. Well, um, you know what? I'm just going to screen share you my platform and mention a few points on it. Go for it. Just, uh, oh, you have Thank to you enable. My Please read again. it out loud. Yeah, oh, absolutely, of course. You got to enable my screen sharing, though. Maybe I'll just read it. So you can find this at platform.adamgolding.ca. It also includes sheet music of the song Evict John Tory, which is intended to market the hashtag, which is intended to market the playlist, which is intended to market the crime committed by our mayor. Um, so the, I mean, some of it is symbolic. We mentioned Khalil and he, how he was saving lives. Um, we should apologize to him as a city um, and give him the key to the city and you know pay his legal costs. And um, you know, luckily, he, I hear he's working on shelter vehicles, which maybe aren't going to be regulated the same way. But there are lots of people that I cross paths who said, "Oh, we can't build something because we'll get sued like Khalil was." 
Um, so it's objectively a chilling effect on people trying to help. And uh, we have to actually ban mass evictions, not just not have them. And we have to have a shelter subsidy. We have to give people some kind of cash payment, which is universal. I understand that a universal benefit maybe can't be as much, but we can at least start with that. We can have a universal part and a selective part, perhaps, although the selective part has the overhead of like administering a benefit system. But, but if somebody says um, the largest universal benefit we can give people in Toronto is zero dollars, they're incorrect. The largest universal benefit we can give people in Toronto is at least one dollar. Some people would say that it's ten dollars. Some people say that it's a hundred dollars. Whatever that number is, if you have a, if you split it up and say, well, here's the amount we can afford to make universal for shelter. Here's the part we can afford to make universal for food. Um, it might not be enough to cover those costs because we don't, might not be that wealthy as a city yet until we cut other things. But we can get the, we can get started the idea that the number is non-zero. Once the number is non-zero, we can have a debate later about changing it, but we also need to index it to inflation. So basically, if, if we are really stingy and say, look, we're going to start with a shelter subsidy, but like this month, we can only give everybody in the city 10 bucks. Um, well, that 10 bucks, as long as it's, as long it, if it's 10 bucks, it should change with inflation. So if, if, if the cost of living doubles, then next year it's 20 bucks. And to go beyond inflation, that's another conversation of increasing the benefit, but the increases and the decreases have to all be relative to inflation. This is actually what they do in Quebec and mm -hmm. they don't have this argument. I mean, that's more at the provincial level that we, we could see how much we can afford municipally if we're doing something municipally and say, look, we can't afford to literally pay everyone's rent um, because the, the feds would have to like turn this into a super socialist government and pass real basic income or something <laughs> like that. But, but we can afford to, to, you know, to, to make it not quite so painful. Um, and it, we, we have to, we have to, we have to uh, see what, what the, it's really about political possibility. You could say, oh, you got to look at the budget. You really, it's a matter of what you can pass, you know, to be honest. Mm -hmm. When it comes to basic needs, you can, you can trim a little bit off of everything. Really, the Fed should be involved, uh, kicking in uh, because they can print money. Um, of course, Tory's always complaining that Doug doesn't give him enough money. I've heard that even Doug thinks Tory will waste the money. So that's on the, on the universal benefits. <laughs> Yeah, and, it's, it's um, not like Tory has shown himself to be a smart allocator of funds. <laughs> yeah, I don't like what he's doing. Yeah, um, it, that's sad to say that. Well, I, I don't. You know what? Although probably not a lot of people believe that Doug Ford is smarter than John Tory, I can guarantee you that Doug Ford believes that Doug Ford is smarter than John Tory. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> and um, just last night, I was at Bampot where um, I'm hoping to move my launch party tonight because oh yeah i was mentioning before we started the formal recording i'm having a launch party this will be released much later but right now it's uh, what wednesday the 28th and i'm launching my campaign tonight after a long grueling pre-campaign and the bar that i've been hosting at every wednesday just went out of business yesterday over non-paying yeah. rent so that's like you know a crazy situation and anyway i was at bampot last night talking about this because i might host it there um waiting for confirmation from the the owner owner um the um a, a fellow that i showed the platform to he just stood in silence and looked at the platform for a while and he said nothing except for one thing he mentioned the next point which is the vacancy tax that i have on this platform and it's very relevant to this bar closing and i'll explain that in a second so the vacancy tax on my platform is more aggressive than the socialist alliances platform the socialist alliance has proposed a 30 percent vacancy tax i have proposed doubling it every month until vacancies are near zero um, huh. Basically, if that causes a problem, you'd find out a particular month, but I think it would uh, be good. And this person was just in silence and they, they said nothing except that one, that policy I like. And I was like, well, that's the one that's even more aggressive than the Socialist Alliance. And it would have helped out because right now that bar is probably going to sit empty, just like mm -hmm. Eden Hall and just like the boat where there also was a Wednesday open mic that was very near and dear to me. And you know, we are destroying our own culture over like a numerical calculation. You know, culture yeah. is worth a lot more than numbers. <laughs> and there should be a rule against destroying our own culture on ourselves, because that's what we're doing when we shut down a bar uh, over some dispute between like a manager and a rental person. And the musicians get caught in the crossfire in the community mm -hmm. who benefits from those musicians. And, you know, these are unpaid musicians at open mics most of the time doing really great work uh, building community. You know, it, it's no different than shutting down a church for months and months and months because the church didn't pay rent. Um, you know, if, if anything, the city should step in and say, oh, okay, well, we're gonna do some of the managing uh, because we think this, this business could do more business and we're gonna get more money to the landlord that way and do less of us subsidizing or whatever. At any rate, mm -hmm. um, in the new platform, you'll see there's a bunch of stuff, arts, uh, there's, there's an arts platform which touches on some of these other things like paying musicians and whatnot, but uh, we have to double vacancy tax monthly. Uh, it's a kind of gradual expropriation. 
And as far as expropriation, we have to explore how that overlaps with land back. Actually, that's something mm -hmm. we've some meeting probably public meetings about it very soon. And in fact, that brings me to the next point. We need to have a daily public meeting about homelessness. Um, Chris Glover has a great one that needs to be scaled up. He does a homelessness work group. He invites experts like from Seeds of Hope and there's various groups that, that that work on homelessness and and know what they're talking about. I learned a lot there. And a meeting like that could be daily. It could be like the COVID briefings that we had. You know, the, like mm -hmm. the a, one one incumbent probably couldn't do it. It would be the actual city probably funding it. And um, you know, um, you could do it in person. You could do it in front of city hall with a big bonfire. You could say like everybody who's who's homeless today come here, and we'll see visually. This is the problem. You know. Um, you know, online is going to exclude some people, so you'd have to have like a camera and mic to actually include people. A lot of these Zoom meetings don't actually include the homeless because they don't have access to a Zoom meeting or like Kensington had like a safety meeting that like the people who are at least safe couldn't participate in because they don't actually have the internet in any meaningful way. And the people who are concerned with their safety were the affluent people who were, you know, the laptop class. This is during COVID. So this like safety <laughs> meeting excluded the people who were at risk and, 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 and made it like they were the threat. Uh, you know, what else is new? Um, so we need a daily public meeting that everybody can participate in. And um, in addition to subsidies, we need rent control like Jessica Bell's Rent Stabilization Act. Um, actually, I'll be canvassing with her tomorrow. Um, she uh, has proposed something which I proposed myself when I was just ranting and not really in politics, which is that rent control. I mean, maybe it's, it's obvious enough that many people have said this. Um, the rent control should apply to the location, not the person. So here where I, have, I live right now, although our landlord is wonderful, if he did want to evict us, uh, he would make money uh, because yeah. the new tenants would pay more. Um, mm -hmm. Even though we've done nothing wrong, we've been great tenants and it's a perverse incentive to evict tenants who have done nothing wrong and not been a problem. And, and just, you know, it's um, so the rent should stay the same. The rent control should be unit specific. Uh, incidentally, liquor licenses should be the other way around. Liquor licenses should be business specific because Fairland Funhouse in Kensington never happened because they were afraid that the it was a sublease of liquor donuts. They were afraid liquor donuts would go to business and the new business would inherit the liquor license because that's how the laws work. And so they didn't want to give a liquor license to the location. They didn't care what the business was, the, the residents. Mm. They, they knew the liquor license didn't go to the business. It went to the spot. Uh, now imagine if rent control was like that. It's kind of funny that liquor licenses are like, yeah, you can keep the old liquor license, but for a person living there, like, no, you can't keep the old rent. Really? No, no. That's a, that's, a, that's yeah. fucked up is what that's called. And um, uh, we need to build more mental health treatment facilities. Um, housing first is a, a sort of a nice idea in a very vague sense. And But if you look at uh, SHJN's winter plan, um, they mention how housing first is a failed policy in Toronto. And uh, well, you know, it is. And that um chris murray the city manager can you guys hear me right now uh, why don't why don't you just pause while you plug in oh i'm yeah. so fast two seconds okay so it's murray <laughs> the city manager um in the 10th annual city manager's address held by the monk school did not appear to have read shjn 60 page report about uh the winter plan for homelessness because he said, oh, everyone agrees that housing first is the way to go. Well, they have pages and pages in that report called housing first is a failed strategy in Toronto. And there's a lot of reasons. Partly, it doesn't really mean housing first. There's some weird um, caveats on the program where you have to be homeless for a certain amount of time to qualify and this kind of thing. So some of it is the nitty gritty, but some of it is a very broad thing, which I also heard from a counselor from Bradford that I spoke to on the phone many months ago. He said, you have to build treatment facilities first. Because, yeah, there are some people who just need housing, and for those people, great, just give them the housing. So it is housing first for some people. But for some people, it is treatment first, and that they need basically some kind of 24-7 treatment facility that they can go to and stay there and sleep there and also leave freely, that they, can, mm -hmm. they should be able to come and go to some kind of treatment facility. And uh, uh, it, sounds, uh, go ahead. it sounds like what's needed is stability first. For some people, housing is what they need for stability. For some people, treatment is what they need for stability. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's stability and support that people need, and that's the need we need to address. That's a really good way to phrase it, Emily. Yeah, yeah. That stability might come from mental health professionals. You know, if if you just if you give somebody who's having a really serious mental health time um, uh, housing, they might actually ruin the housing and lose their housing. Um, mm -hmm. And this is what this counselor, he's you know, from Bradford, was telling me that he'd seen happen on a smaller scale in Toronto. And he felt that he'd made the mistake for 10 years of pushing just for housing and not pushing for the mental health treatment. And so he, he was ranting me like he wants people to learn from his mistake, uh, this guy. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we have to build mental health treatment facilities. Basically, deinstitutionalization has been a disaster. If anyone's not aware of that, we basically figured we could save money by kicking everyone out of the uh, asylums, quote unquote. 
And uh, so while we have our open air asylums in the street, I don't believe that the mentally ill should lose their freedoms any, any more than unless they're violent or something like that. Um, so we, we it, it, that's where the spirit came from. But but here's the thing. This happens all the time with right libertarians. They say, we'll give you your freedom as it will give you fucking nothing. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because yeah. uh, negative liberty is we won't interfere. Positive is we might actually help you and give you yeah. the freedom by giving you resources. Um, no, absolutely. Anyway. Some other things included in the MSA platform, for example, obviously uh, safe injection sites to be well-funded, more public washrooms, uh, obviously uh, stopping the uh, no camping bylaw, so stopping the criminalization of these things. So a number of different approaches to uh, yeah. eliminate the state violence against the most vulnerable while simultaneously building up community supports for all people, starting with the most vulnerable in our society. Yeah. I want... As, you know, as we're starting to wrap up to there, yeah, the, the thing you mentioned is there also in my platform, the repealing the no camping bylaw and also holding a judicial inquiry into what happened. I mentioned earlier that only Perks and Matlow voted for that inquiry. We need to do mm -hmm. that. And so actually, so let's with the last uh, kind of five minutes here, let's talk a little bit about your writing specifically. So University of Rosedale, that was Mike Layton's uh, old writing. So the son of Jack Layton, city councilor, very popular kind of the face of the so-called progressive caucus in Toronto is not rerunning again. So who are you running against and what's been the, I don't know, what have you been finding uh, locally, politically <clears throat> in your writing happening during this campaign? Well, I don't particularly want to give them free advertising. You can look them all up on the city's website, but I can tell you some things about all of them. Anyone give who us, has any, give us their, give us their vibe. Yeah. Any, anyone who has any chance against me is a parachute. Um, mm -hmm. For those of you who don't know what this is, it's someone who doesn't live here. It's an invasion of people trying to take over my home. This is where I have lived for 20 years. There is no one with any chance who actually lives here. I know because I have the voters list and Toronto Star said the same thing. They don't live here. They're not your neighbors. They do not represent you. Mm -hmm. I am the only change candidate in this ward. These other people are being parachuted in by various establishment groups who want to keep things the same. They want to keep their same friends making the same money. Everybody on city council is friends with each other, which is why they'll never hold each other accountable. You need a real change can in this ward. Don't vote for a parachute anywhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, I love it. Adam, amen, amen. if you have now a minute and a half to speak directly to someone in the city, as we know, municipal elections have the lowest voter turnout. It's probably going to be considerably below 50%, because even the last provincial election was below 50%. If, if somehow this podcast finds its way to someone who has never voted before in a municipal election and they see nothing for them there, what do you say to them in one minute? I beg of you, listen to the entire hashtag Evict John Tory playlist on YouTube. You might not have the energy to vote. You have the energy to sit at home on YouTube. Some of it's traumatic. You can skip the long ones. Just watch the short ones. There's a lot of information there. If everybody... If we could clockwork orange, strap everyone down and show them that playlist, John Tory would lose in a heartbeat. And John, mm -hmm. you better look for a new job. Oh, wait, you already have one at Rogers. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so, so much, Adam, for your time and all the best with your platform. Um, as I've said a couple of times, check our um, check our podcast description for all of the information uh, that Adam was sharing today and please get out and vote. Uh, this is this is a really, really important municipal election and there are lots of amazing progressive candidates running. There are also lots of really scary right wing candidates running and a lot of establishment candidates running who just want to keep things the damn same. So get out there get some change into city council. And again, Adam, thank you for all of your time and effort in this campaign and all the best. Thank you. And I'll see you at adamgolding.ca. Amazing. All right, so I'm stopping my Audacity recording. <laughs>